Welcome to the Augmented Advisor. Today, we're talking with rising LinkedIn star, Mando Salavante. And if you want to build your business on LinkedIn, this is the episode for you. We're going to talk about how to create engaging content. We're going to talk about how to extend your reach with commenting and engagement. And maybe most importantly, we're going to talk about how to convert. We're going to talk about creating leads. Enjoy. Mando Salavante the third man. Welcome to the Augmented Advisor. John, appreciate you having me, man. Really excited to dive in today. Me too, my friend. Me too, my friend. And recent friend at that. Like, we're going to talk about LinkedIn today. That's actually how we got together and started to kick it. It's, it's an amazing journey. It's crazy because we were engaging a little bit on LinkedIn. Then we had that initial conversation. Then we, you know, we talked a couple times after that. Man, I feel like I've known you for like, Five years, and it's, I think it's about five weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's, been, it's it's insane. It's insane. It's like it's the the power of LinkedIn that we're going to talk about today. And so let's let's give the audience a little preview of what the show is going to be about. So one of the things we're going to talk about is the anatomy of a LinkedIn post that's successful. And man, you got some successful posts. So this is going to be fun. We're going to pull it apart. We're going to show it on screen. We'll talk about what's in there, why. We're going to talk about the different post types that you use and in general, we'll talk about engagement. And man, that is a unique animal on LinkedIn. And you're going to want to stay tuned for that because it makes all the difference on LinkedIn. We're going to learn about you, my friend. We're going to dig into how you got started. We're going to talk about conversion, which you're killing it on and, and building an audience. And then we'll wrap the show. So to start, can you do me a favor? Can you talk about just at a high level, this recent journey from zero to what, 23,000 followers in 18 months. Can you talk a little bit, just a brief amount about, about this? We're going to loop back to it and talk about sort of what it's done for your business in that time. I think my, my story of why I chose LinkedIn as a platform will be really helpful to the listeners. So let, let's go back to when I'm in college. My senior year of college, It's the middle of the COVID pandemic. I'm reselling sneakers at the time, just trying to make some extra money. I'm bored, finding something to do. And I built that an account for that on Instagram to 10,000 followers, selling over 100 pairs of sneakers a month and did over $100,000 of revenue in sneaker sales over the course of five months. Doing that, I pretty much decided when I got into financial services Why don't I just replicate it? Why don't I just bring those strategies over to LinkedIn and do what I was doing there? Now, the difference was when I started on LinkedIn, I had that in mind, but I didn't necessarily take my advice. And and what I mean by that, John, I went on to LinkedIn like every financial advisor does. I pitched everybody that I knew. I sent out connection requests doing the same. And I thought, hey, it's a game of numbers. If I just pitch a bunch of people... Some of them will bite and I'll get clients. Well, as you can imagine, it didn't necessarily happen that way. I did get some clients, not necessarily sticky business, a lot of wasted time. And that began originally in late 2020 when I when I started in financial services. Fast forward all the way to 2022, mid-2022, I, I really crafted an actual strategy with LinkedIn. I took Justin Welsh's LinkedIn operating system. It's like such a stereotype. Justin Welsh is like this big, famous LinkedIn influencer teaching people how to build their business on LinkedIn. And I'm one of his success stories for sure, because that was the spark in starting my journey. So July 19th of 2022 was the first day that I really started a strategy. Over time, posting, going along that route, I got seven clients from the platform in 2022. 2023, I got 34 clients from the platform. Thus far, it's March 28th in 2024, and I've gotten 11 clients from the platform. And I anticipate that's probably going to be around 40. That's really the number that I want to be at for our business growth. So it it's on the pace that I want to be on. But just high level, that that's really been the journey. And, and of course, there's details, and we're going to get into some of that today. But that has been why I chose LinkedIn, 
how I sort of got sparked and then what some of the results have been. What do you think, again, we're going to go into the details, like you say, but what do you think at a high level helped you break out? I mean, to your point, a lot of financial advisors get on there and they're like, this LinkedIn thing stinks. I get no leads, et cetera, but you are crushing it. It's a great question. Why, like, why have I broken out? Why have I become a thought leader? And I say that very loosely because I don't necessarily look at myself as like this guru, but I do recognize that it is what it is, man. Yeah, I do recognize like what I've created. I'm not going to underscore that by any means. I think my biggest advantage with LinkedIn, but also in my business. I am the guy who will will die on the hill that I do not know what I don't know. And even now where I sit here today and I'm getting 400,000 views a month on LinkedIn, I still think there's stuff for me to learn. I'm still trying to learn from other people. And I think that's what's helped me break out. Also, I am not shy to show the personal side of my life and I'm not shy to lean into who I am. I am not the suit and tie advisor who's wearing Alan Edmonds loafers every single day and won't show you a bit of what they do other than being this number crunching calculator guy. Like one big thing that I share all the time and and really a principle of my business when I work with clients, the money stuff matters. We're going to get to that money stuff, but that's going to take care of itself when we take care of the personal stuff. So what do we want Mm -hmm. personal life to look like? not only today, but in the future as well. And let's just define on the money side, what is enough? Not what is the maximum amount of money we could put away? What's enough? And let's maximize your personal life without depleting your financial life. And and I think a big reason that I've broken out is because of that concept. And people who are not in finance really resonate with that because everybody wants to do better with their money but a lot of people have a negative connotation with financial advisors that when you go talk to one, they are going to tell you to stop living your life. Mm. Man, there's, there's a ton to unpack in there. But when I when I replay what I just heard, the first thing I hear is a willingness to learn, which sounds obvious. But you know, to your point, a lot of people just keep banging on the same door over and over and over again. And as a result, they're not going to move forward, right? It's it's a form of insanity to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. And the this authenticity, so I'll use the word you you didn't, I know it's kind of punched around a lot, but this idea that you are willing to be who you are, right? Take it or leave it, preferably take it, is incredibly powerful. And we're starting to see other advisors follow that same path. And while most of them are not having the level of success you are, they are clearly having more success than the folks who push out a market commentary and hope someone cares, which is, you know, that is, those are big differences. They they sound small, but they're, they're actually pretty enormous. And I'd love to get into your actual content now and see how that comes across. And I think And I think it really does. One of the things that was amazing when I got to know you, which is, you know, like, like you say, five weeks ago, and it feels like five years. But I think that acceleration of, of relationship is partly due to your content and how you deliver who you are right through the platform and that level of comfort it just makes it easy to get to know you. At least that's been my experience. So maybe we should jump into your your post and and we could take a look at. You want to do a one of your bigger posts recently? We can we can jump in. Yeah, whatever whatever you want to share to here, we'll, we'll go we'll go to that. We'll come back to profile because when we start to talk conversions, this is the workhorse. I'm on LinkedIn, and and. Yours is dialed in pretty nice and we're going to want to talk about that. But let's just talk about one of your posts. Like we'll talk about a bigger post. And maybe for context, we'll talk about today's post real quick, just to give a sense of how much engagement you might have in a typical post and kind of how it happens. But today we're sitting at 
twelve thirty ish. We got a post here, and we won't talk about the the content. But at this point, already, you've got. 118 you know likes and reactions you got 164 comments some of those are your replies so pretty good but let's dive in and see what a little more mature post that that hit so this post my side hustles which I love this is a great post and this one's got more like let's take a look before we get there look at that 443 reactions and 330 comments. Like that's a lot of engagement. You got a little community happening here. So we'll we'll dial back in and take a look at the post and maybe you can walk us through the shape of the post. Like what's the first thing, second thing you think about and kind of how it's structured and how you think about it. And obviously for those who are listening, this post is about side hustles and we'll read little bits of it. So if you're on audio, you'll hear all this. So jump in, my man. With content in general, I think some important context for me to give is my my strategy overall in terms of what are my real pillars and what am I mixing in and, and why? So I do I have a seven day strategy across the board. Why? Seven days a week. It's easy to keep track of that way. I go from top of funnel to middle of funnel to bottom of funnel. I'm going to start at bottom because that's very simple. A bottom of funnel post is me just selling my service saying, book a call with me very hard. No, Not that there's no value, but there's minimal value and it's just like sell. Middle of funnel is where I'm showing expertise in financial planning And I'm trying to position my service as a solution and position me as someone who could provide value, which is pretty much what my today post that we we looked at before is like positioning expertise. The top of funnel is appealing to the masses in terms of anyone interested in finance, but also sharing my personal finance journey, which I would consider this post that top of funnel sharing my personal finance journey. Why I'm giving that context. My post today, you know, you mentioned it's about 120 likes so far in three hours, 160 comments or whatever that was. That'll probably end up around 200 in both of those ballparks, maybe a little higher. That post is natural. Like if you lined these up and I didn't know the numbers, I would immediately tell you that post is going to get less engagement because middle of funnel, I'm appealing to a smaller audience because I'm trying to show these solutions. So anyone that's going to consume that and interact with it, they have to already know I have a financial problem. So that's why I'm reading this. Now, this post, this could appeal to anybody and everybody. So let's dive into this though, now that we have that context. Whenever I'm writing, I think in this framework, poke a pain, agitate the pain, Maybe agitate it a little more and paint the scenario to give the full context. And then I'm pivoting to a solution or pivoting to value or pivoting to something I can give as a takeaway to the audience. Sometimes there'll be a call to action at the end, not every time, but that's the general framework. So if we look at this post, John, the hook to start, my side hustles nearly ruined my career. Yours can ruin yours Yours can ruin yours if you are not careful. Right there, anybody who has a side hustle is going, one, they're probably going to be mad at me. They're probably going to disagree and be like, what's this guy saying? It it invokes emotion. So now they're going to read the post though. That's important. You always want to invoke emotion with those first two lines of the post because that's what they see before they click to see more. Then I start painting the scene. So, okay, rewind to my last year in college. I had a full plate. I was reselling sneakers, selling workout programs. I was interning with my company. I didn't know what I was going to do. And and I give the context of like, look, I I had this successful sneaker business. I was selling personal training plans and training people and having success there. I also was doing pretty good as an intern. And I thought I could do all three. And I'm pivoting then to say, I could not. Because my main thing, which is financial advice... I struggled. Right. And why did I struggle? I was being Let's pulled down in too a many bit directions. And talk about that. So I threw the side hustles away. I went all in with this. And I'm able to exhibit four years later, 
I'm, I've built a successful business and I'm on a great growth trajectory. So I'm giving the, the, the reader as a takeaway here, learn from me. Don't, don't try to work out without a trainer. Don't try to do your taxes without a CPA. Don't try to manage your money yourself. Hint, that's what I do. Focus on your career, spend time with your family, et cetera. And I'm just exhibiting to them, like, keep the main thing to the main thing. So this post does a couple things very important. Number one, it shares about my personal financial journey, but I'm also right. exhibiting a strongly held belief of mine, which I already said, I don't know what I don't know. I'm trying to ingrain that in my audience's mindset so that when they feel that financial pain, I'm top of mind and they do come to me. I'm not going to get a lead from this post today, which I don't remember. I, th I think I actually might have gotten one or two from this post, but my goal is not to get the lead from this post today. It's to get the lead a month from this post being posted. Right. And I think that that is a, a mistake that many on LinkedIn will make is just sell, 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 right? A little value and, and that they have trouble seeing the strategic reason for a post like this. But I think that's a really great breakdown. And it sounds like a lot of this is these are also the kinds of posts that actually build your audience, right? Is it's the kind of post that will reach further than your, you know, your first and secondary connections in a way that the more targeted stuff won't. And then the the images on posts. So this is a style of post just called a, an image post where you got a single image and and I've got a, a DM. Look at that. I'm I'm ringing up the DMs while we talk here. So so you've got this you've got this image, and this is a kind of classic LinkedIn style of post, which is just text and an image. You know, talk a, b a little bit about what you think about when you're you're doing an image. Now, obviously, this is related to the subject of the post, but but what are the other things you think about when you're choosing an image? Well, for this one, I think it's it's perfect to use as an example because I knew I was talking about my past side hustles. I still collect sneakers and it's a big hobby of mine, which was why I had gotten into that business in college in general. I turned a passion into something to make money as a college kid. But this, I'm like, well, you know, I got this wall of sneakers. Let's get the craziest pair, hold it in my hand, take a picture that's a selfie. So my face is there. People see me in front of the sneakers and they know that I'm, I'm a sneaker guy. Like it's, it's not out of the ordinary for me to be wearing a pair of sneakers with a suit. Like that's, that's my thing. And one, I got wide feet, so they don't fit great in loafers, but two, I love sneakers. So clients, like what's been so eye opening to me when you lean into yourself, clients love it. I can't tell you the meetings that I've had. Now, a lot of my meetings are, are online because I'm all over the country and zoom is the main thing, but my clients in person, when I have like sneakers on with the suit, they're like, Oh my God, that is awesome. Like, I love that. And, and it's just like, huh? People will like you for who you are if you lean into it. So picture wise, though, that's why I got into this. Other other things, I mean, I think if you can relate the picture to what you're talking about, that is by far the most important part. A big mistake I see is just people having out of context pictures with nothing to do with what they're writing about. A generic selfie could be something that's like, okay, obviously that's not really going to relate to a post, but I think there's value there because as a financial advisor, people are getting familiarity with your face. That's important because it's hard to talk to an advisor. It's hard to talk about money. If they feel comfortable with you, it goes a long way. Yeah. And you do see that a lot on LinkedIn. And you know, I'll be honest, when I jumped on and started to recommit, and I'm late to the game, brother, I just started January 1st, and I just couldn't understand it. And I have recently embraced the idea of, okay, selfies sometimes are really what the doctor ordered. And it can just be a picture of you because you are the one delivering the message. Now, it is so much more fun to see this kind of a picture, though. It does it does a lot more to convey the message. And I know that you you mix it up, right? Sometimes it's just a selfie. And sometimes it's kind of a branded selfie. You've got this thing where you love to have a selfie in your auto and you've got this distinctive red seatbelt, which is awesome. So there can be branded el branding elements to that. I want to make a point on that, not to cut you off, but I do want to yeah. make this point. 
working with a coach of mine in the past, Nat Berman, Nat had told me, cause I never thought about the red seatbelt as like a branding type of thing, but, and, and my hair as well, which is another reason that I do selfies a lot. You got People good hair, would always make, well, like I never <laughs> even thought about like, Oh, I have good hair. I just, Oh, I have hair. But People make comments about my hair, the red seatbelt, and the sneakers anytime they're in a post. So Nat said to me, he's like, dude, don't you realize that you should just be doubling down like as much as you could possibly integrate this stuff into your content? Because if you're just known for this, you're known for this. It doesn't matter if hair has anything to do with finance. You're just the finance guy that has hair and a red seatbelt and wears sneakers. And people remember that. That's the whole point. What can you be remembered for? Yeah. So takeaway to the audience is I don't know what your red seatbelt or your sneakers or your hair is, but figure out what is you and what can you lean into? Yeah, that. I mean, Jesus, <laughs> it is so important and it's so difficult for so many people on social media and it was hard for me, right? So I'm a, I'm a bit older than you, my friend. And, and jumping into this was a bit of a soul searching experience because I get the same advice because, you know, you introduced me to Nat, started working with Nat, being part of his community, et cetera. And sometimes when you're older, you kind of forget, you get away from what makes you, you, right? Because you just take it all for granted. You don't think about it much. And even when you're young, you don't really think about that. You just you just are who you are. And getting that third party, that, that other outside observer to say, hey, man, you got to lean into this thing is super powerful because it does make you distinctive in a way that is entirely you. Nobody can, nobody can copy that. And if they did, it would just be a meme about you, right? It, it's... It, it's it's so powerful and so subtle in so many ways, but but I love this. And this is another post that really I thought lit it up. And and I remember reacting to this post myself. So this post, what 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 it was crazy to me about this post, what two things. One, it was about taxes. And I did a post about taxes and it blew up, and I didn't expect that. It was after you did this. And so this post is about taxes and it's really short, which most of your posts are not short. And the photo is not of you, but it is of your breakfast of, of eggs and bacon. By the way, it looks delicious. So talk a little bit about this post and how this weaves into your strategy. Yeah. So this is straight up a promo to get opt-ins for my newsletter. LinkedIn is my main thing, but I think email marketing is a good spigot on the wheel to have as another source of client generation or just audience generation in general. So in this, it's the same framework in the beginning, poke the pain, agitate the pain. The only difference is I'm giving zero value or solution in this, and I'm completely pivoting to today in my newsletter, I'm going over this. It's coming in an hour. Subscribe here. And I have the link in my post. Gurus of LinkedIn will say, never have a link in your post. I'll tell you right now, John, some of my top performing posts are literally links to newsletter, links to articles I've written, links to YouTube videos I've been in. The reason being, links in your post are not bad if they are something that people will actually click on. So if your posts with links are, if your posts with links are doing bad, they're doing bad because quite frankly, you're not doing a good enough job setting up that link to be clicked on. Yeah. So that's that's what set this up to do really well. The breakfast, I threw that picture in because of one line that I put in the post. I was just like, and I put this line in the post. Let me actually take one step back before I explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ta taxes, taxes are, are one of the most common reasons that people come and work with us. Not and we don't file taxes. We're we're financial planners, me and my team. So we're we're tax planning for the future and looking out and saying like, how can we efficiently you know manage our assets and whatnot. But it's a big pain for a lot of high earners, and I think 
it's one of those things where people will have a pain on taxes and that's what gets them on the Zoom call. But once they meet with us and talk to us, there's other pains that we uncover and help help them realize like they didn't know what they didn't know. We bring the professional process we have to the table and now they're starting to see other pains. So tax, knowing that about taxes, this was a topic that I think is just set up to do very well. So just like a, an extreme example, if you talk about LinkedIn on LinkedIn and growing on LinkedIn, yeah. your stuff is going to blow up. Those Always. people, whoever, whoever it is, like you don't, it, it's, it's going to blow up because everyone wants to read about that. Taxes are sort of that of finance. So that's what blew this up. But I thought it was just funny with the breakfast photo and why I added that in. I was like, how could I like close this post off? And, you know, I say here, it's coming to your inbox in one hour. While I let that anticipation build, I'm going to enjoy my breakfast and throw in like a smiley, <laughs> a, like a smiley face as like a half joking, like, uh-huh. like almost like, you know, punch in the shoulder type of deal here. So I, I said, Hey, let's take a break from the selfies today. We'll throw in a picture of the breakfast and, and just be a little bit funny. And, and it got, yeah. I actually got a lot of engagement about that comment on this post. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of engagement for the, for the post for particularly for something that, as you mentioned, it's more, Offer based, it's bottom of the funnel, 238 or so engagements and 352 comments. That's a that's a fair amount. But I, what I thought was crazy was what you mentioned just before the show went on live was how successful this was for the newsletter. So share that. Yeah, so my newsletter goes out every Wednesday at 9 a.m. And my my LinkedIn posts go out every day at 8 a.m. Eastern time. I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania. So on Wednesdays when my newsletter goes out, I'll use the social post as a way to drive newsletter opt-ins. Typically, I'm getting 15 to 25 opt-ins on an average post. This one got like 80. So I was stunned by how many opt-ins that got, even with yeah. the engagement. Like I've had posts get similar engagement to this for the newsletter, but none of them have gotten the opt-ins here. I think that goes back to taxes. It's a topic that a lot of yeah. people want inf- want to read about, want to get educated on. So I think for me, that that tells me at the very least, I need to talk about taxes more. Yeah, for sure. That is a good lesson. But I think what's amazing to me is, heck, even 15 or 20 newsletter subs on a single post, and that's a lot from the perspective of most financial advisors that I know of. Um, that's, a, that's a really great return on a single post and just goes to show you the value of building the audience that you've you've got, right? And in a banger like this, I mean, the 80 is just outstanding results for for something like this. Talking a little bit about post types. So this is another image post, but you've also started to incorporate video. And now this is a ways back and we'll talk about in a second why, why we have to go back a couple of weeks to find a video post. But can you talk about why and how you like to use video? Now, the structure of the, the text in this is very similar. But talk us through, you know, video and how you think about it and how you think about the text compared to what's in the video. The text that captions my video, I approach it the same way I would just a post that was only text with an image, for example. And what I mean by that is I want to make it easy to consume my content. I want to make it easy to do business with me. So if you're someone that you don't have time to watch a video and maybe you want to scan and get the gist of the post, I'm going to make you be able to do that. If you're someone that wants to watch the video, do that do that as well and go right ahead. Why I think video is important, it brings another sense into the content. You can hear me. You can see my mannerisms. You can see I talk with my hands because I'm this crazy Italian. Like <laughs> I'm an Irish but, guy. I talk with my hands too. So right, but it's important because John, think of, think if you're just someone who's in my target market in, in tech, and you're a, you're a successful professional, and you've re- you've watched my posts, you've read my posts, you've seen me on video. 
And finally, one day I say something that just strikes a chord and you're like, I got to talk to this guy. I don't know if I'm going to work with him, but what the heck? I got to hear what's going on in this guy's world. You are going to feel so comfortable on that first call with me because you already know that when I really emphasize a point, I tend to nod my head like this, or I use my hand or I throw this hand over. Like, you know, these mannerisms that I do and how I sound. So you're going to feel comfortable. Like you've already been on a call with me, me before. That's been super powerful for when prospects book meetings and then become clients with me through the the sales process of, of gaining a new financial planning client. I talked to a lot of YouTubers and prior episode was a YouTuber. Next episode looks like it's going to be a YouTuber. And they report exactly that, that when the prospect comes in or jumps on a, a Zoom call the prospect acts and feels like and reports to them that they feel like they already know them, right? There's no get to know you period. And there's no other medium that can do that. Exactly. Um, it It's, it's incredibly powerful, which is, I mean, I know you know this, why it's why we have this show is why this is so video centric and why I encourage financial advisors in particular to do video because you are your differentiation. It's not your investment strategies. It's not this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, you got to talk about all that. But at the end of the day, people pick working with you, right? They have to see you. They have to know you. And it is so amazing the impact that video has on that. It's also why instead of doing a first phone call, doing a, doing a video call makes such a difference. But this is even more powerful because it can be repeat exposure to you over time and build a relationship when you're off doing something else. It's it's phenomenal. And now on LinkedIn, you do hear some things about video, you know, not getting as much reach or as much engagement. And <clears throat> this looks slightly lower, but the trade-off doesn't look like much. I mean, here we're talking about, you know, 225-ish engagements and 275-ish comments. So it's not that far off of your big posts, but but man, the 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 amount of you that comes through is even more, which is so powerful. I'm curious if you ever look at any of the LinkedIn video analytics and what that's told you, or if you don't bother. I'm smiling, man, because you're you're relatively spot on in terms of like you know people do say oh video gets impacted with reach and engagement sometimes well if i do the math on my engagement and i'm i'm pulling this up i i will share my screen to this once i have this pulled up so we can literally see it and yeah no worries I'll, just... I'll stop mine and uh, let's let's go to yours so let's Let's quite frankly do the math on this live because I think that will give us some some credibility here. Yeah, absolutely. And and to so to, just so everybody knows, go. you have video analytics in in LinkedIn. It's not particularly great, especially compared to other platforms, but it does exist. So let's talk about this. So John, five point six million impressions in three hundred sixty five days. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If you do the math on that, that's 15,427 per day. I post once a day, so you can pretty much assume that's 15,000 a post, right? If we look at my top performing posts and I go to show more here, let's see how many videos are over 15,000. 64, we have 40, 40, we have... 33. There's a bunch here in the 30s. 30, 30. There's going to be a couple more. You can see 25. So it's like that just shows the whole narrative that video kills your reach. No, it doesn't. It's if people actually watch your video or if they actually read what you're talking about. That is what kills your reach because you're just not good enough on video or you're not, you're not framing your video well enough. The hook isn't strong enough. So with my videos, everything, I, I work with the team. I work with Danny Del Vecchio's team. For anyone listening who knows Great Danny, guy. you can look him up on LinkedIn. Danny comes to our calls and he has the hooks ready to go. And, and he strategizes that and he's like, dude, I know your niche. 
I know what you're doing. I know the, the message you're trying to portray. Here's the hooks. Let's talk about them. And we go with those. And everything yeah. is focused on the hook to start a video. Yeah, that that makes such a huge difference because, I mean, video is a different animal. And by the way, everybody sucks on video when they start. But you got to start. The only way you get better is you let yourself suck for a while and you keep going. And And video is a battle every second to keep the attention of the viewer. And you got to structure things in the right way. You think about it. In some ways, it's similar to a post, but but it's a little more intense because every second you can lose someone. And you see this very clearly on platforms like YouTube Shorts and TikTok, where where things can absolutely blow up when when somebody's good at this. But the the thing I'm curious about is. You know, and you don't have to share your screen on this one, but if you grab one of those videos that you looked at and you pull it up and you click on video analytics, I'm curious if you can tell like what your average le length of view. Because, you know, this video we were looking at here just now was, I want to say it's about 42, 45 seconds, something in that area. And what I've found is there, there's this kind of magic barrier that it's hard to get an average of 30 seconds or more. A video and a, usually a successful video, you start to get people over that 30 second barrier. I'm curious if you've seen that or if your text is so strong, it carries, it, it carries the, the job through. Well, I haven't, I haven't actually done the math on that, but I can look now. So I have, I have my views and I have my minutes viewed. Yeah. Give me your, give me your so, minutes viewed as a number. So, so, so like this is one video. The minutes viewed were 2768, 2768. Okay. And that's times 60 seconds. Great. And then, and how many views did you have? The views on the video were 15,950. Great. But okay. now this is now off that number. And with your point, you just made a second ago, this is insightful because this post had 65,000 impressions. It had 15,950 video views. So that goes to show 50,000 yeah. people consume that post in text. So that's why yes. the text is important. You got to be easy to interact with, but yes. anyways, yeah, yeah. let's not get off track here. Yeah, no, no, it's not off track. It's actually on track because the analytics on this make the point. That means an people watched an average of 10 seconds of the video. So your, your, and that's an average, right? So plenty of people watch the whole thing. So what's interesting in the way that you approach video from my perspective, you know, thinking about the YouTube creators I've talked to and, and LinkedIn, LinkedIn has this unique thing where you can support consumption with both the text and the video. And you, you said it earlier, you design it so people can kind of pick and choose. And on LinkedIn, people tend to choose this, you know, medium via text more often than not, but video is still powerful. I've seen other creators on, on LinkedIn where the post itself doesn't explain a lot of video and they want people to consume the video. And, and there, it, you know, you're really trying to push to hit this 30 second mark on LinkedIn, they call it dwell time, right? It's view time in this case, but you you want people to spend time on your posts. And I think strategically, people should really think about what you've done here and what's happening because the video works even when most people aren't consuming it. And that's because of what you do with the text post. So there are different approaches, but this one really, really works because of the way you approach it. I, I think it's I think it's fantastic. Now there's all these other formats on LinkedIn, which I don't typically see you use. I don't typically see you use, you know, carousels as a for instance, or or text only posts. Is there any particular reason or you know you stick with the the ones you're you're good at or you know talk to me about that. I've tried carousels, but they always perform significantly worse than my other content. And all I'm, all I've tried with them is just repackaging content that I've done every time I use them and, and I'll mix them in once in a while just to see like, Oh, maybe like now things will be different, but they have every time I've tried them, they've just performed worse for me. 
just not my style, not really the way I communicate. And honestly, I, I think it goes back to like my style of consuming too. I, I don't read carousels. And if I do, I'll skim them and like look at like one or two slides. Like I just don't. So I think it's a bigger commitment for people when you do a carousel. So that's why I don't do that. Text only. I just think they're boring. Like I'd rather throw a fun picture in or like have a video or whatever with my content. I, I don't know. I just like to have fun with it. It's just, just who I am. I like to show more, more of me every day. So that's been the mindset behind those two things. Yeah. And it, it, it clearly hasn't held you back. Right. And people talk about carousels is, is one of those things where you hear people on LinkedIn in the echo chamber talking about, Oh, carousels, they, they do big, or at least they were in 2023. And the answer is like everything is, I guess, is it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do, what what content there you've got. I've seen a bunch of carousels that kind of look like that style of post where you see people pulling stuff off of Twitter or X or whatever, and it's just a few pages that look like that. And I don't know, that that's pretty boring. I, I've got no interest in paging something, paging through something that's just black and looks like more text. Like, Put it into the post, man. Right. So I feel it's just not my not my style, you know. Yeah. Now the other thing that makes unique LinkedIn unique is engagement and how that relates to your reach and your audience building and and the like. You can float a video on YouTube or TikTok or do a post on Instagram and it can absolutely blow up and you never talk to anybody. LinkedIn doesn't work that way. So can you talk a little bit about engagement, sort of why it's important from your perspective and how you do engagement? Because I know that you both engage with your own stuff, your own post and your community when they comment, as well as, and importantly, lots of other creators. So talk to me about engagement, like why it's important on LinkedIn, what it does for you and how you go about it. There's two components to engagement and two whys behind it. Number one, and I don't know this for sure. I don't think anybody really does, but I think there's a lot of merit to this idea. LinkedIn rewards the people who are active on their platform that post and are using the platform. So I think there's that component to it. If they know you're on the platform and they see you're interacting they are going to reward the post that you put out because they want to keep you there and they want people to be active. So there's that. But so additional reach in terms of reward. Yeah, I think I think there's definitely merit that the algorithm will push your stuff if you are active on the platform. And it makes sense, right? Like LinkedIn as a platform themselves, they will be successful as a as a corporation if people are active on their platform, so they're going to incentivize you to be. Second, the engagement itself, I think a lot of people go wrong here because they just like try to do it for the numbers rather than the quality. I'm more about the quality. I view the, and I, I don't get me wrong, I definitely get numbers in. Like I do two hours every morning, 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. on my schedule. That's my engagement time. But when I'm engaging, I'm not just saying great post or love this or, or like awesome stuff. Like I'm not doing that. I'm trying to go comment on a post, add my unique perspective, maybe even weave in a story if I could, because I'm using that comment as an opportunity for not only the author to read my stuff and think, I got to check Mondo out, but everyone who reads that comment section to think, who's this Mondo guy? I got to check his stuff out. And And that could drive a lot of new followers to my account. And when I'm getting new followers, that's obviously going to bring more engagement on my own posts and when more engagement on my own posts is coming and I'm sending out connection requests to my ideal clients, which my goal on LinkedIn is to get clients for my business. When these ideal clients look at my stuff and they might be resonating with my stuff, likes don't necessarily pay your bills, but likes and comments matter in this effect. If I'm a if I'm a prospective client and I go view someone's profile like me after I just saw them somewhere and I was intrigued and they connected with me or whatever, if my recent post had five likes compared to if it had 250, 
you you subconsciously view me in a different light as an advisor by doing that. And anybody that says otherwise, I will fight you till whenever. The point you is, are it's lying. subconscious. That right? is the truth. That is the yeah, truth. Exactly. Absolutely. Exactly. So I think that that's a big part with engagement for sure. I think the point you made though about when you engage on other people's posts and other creators <clears throat> and how you do, do that strategically is a big deal, right? We, I've heard you say this now. I've heard uh, Nat Berman, who we we both admire and have, has taught us both. Jasmine Leach, talk about it. Making a comment on someone else's post is not just a way to support that creator, great post, but it's a way to build your own audience. And it's an opportunity for a mini post. Now, you can't do that very often. You can't do that a hundred times a day. That would be literally all you would do. But posting or commenting on the right creators that have your audience, you know, people that are your ideal client profile are on their posts and you write that comment, yes, for the creator, but also for the rest of the audience in a compelling way. I mean, man, that's an amazing way to advertise, you, you know, you and, you know, if you think about it, your your headline, right? So part of the key of, of LinkedIn is your profile and your profile headline, your shot, you know, your your face, it's on every comment. And so and there's a there's a breadcrumb trail back to your profile and a way to follow you. So powerful comments do pretty amazing work. I remember I made a comment a, a few weeks back on a pretty good sized creator. And it was a it was a relatively big post. I think she had two hundred thousand followers, something like that. Two hundred two hundred twenty, something like that. My comment alone got seventy five engagements. The, the comment, and I picked up like right. forty followers that day, which is a big day for me, just based on that comment. So it's an incredibly powerful strategy, and it's from my perspective almost totally unique to LinkedIn and the way that the platform works. So if you're not using that as a strategy and you're on LinkedIn and time to up your game, cause it's a, it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity. Now it's an opp opportunity. Like you said, John, view them as mini posts. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Now we talked a little bit about how you got started and, and, how you, how you went along with LinkedIn. And we've mentioned a little bit about the mentors, but you've got a really unique perspective on leveraging mentors. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about that because I think it's been a powerful strategy for you. I know for me, when you introduced me to Nat Berman, who I'm sure you'll talk about, is a complete game changer. I mean, it totally changed my 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 stuff on LinkedIn and and the success that I'm starting to have there. So talk about your approach to um, to mentors and in particular within LinkedIn. Yeah, so it it goes back to Justin Welsh in 2022. I did Justin's course, then I did a coaching call with Justin. That was the beginning of it, and, and things sort of took off from there. Fast forward to last year. I did coaching with Nasheen Chen, who is primarily a coach for public speaking and becoming better at that. She, she's done multiple TED Talks. She's coached leaders of Fortune 50 companies. So I worked with Nasheen. But with speaking, additionally, she also helped me with how do I position myself as a thought leader in the space that I'm in? And then later in the year, moving on to working with Nat, Nat helped me completely rethink branding in general towards LinkedIn and towards my business and what I really need to lean into. You know, I talked before the like jokingly about the hair and the sneakers and the red seatbelt, but other stuff beyond that, those three people, I would say Justin, Nasheen, and Nat were three very big influences along my journey that I did coaching with who had a very big impact. And actually last year I did a second call with Justin. So, you know, we did one in 2023, we, or we did one in 2022, we did one in 2023. And 
I'll probably do another one with him later this year if he has it available because he's always going on and off if he's doing coaching or not. A little busy, I'm sure, right? One, one <laughs> right. One you're, one if you're Justin time. Welsh, you're, you're probably pretty busy if you're Justin <laughs> Welsh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, and the success you've had speaks for itself. I mean, the, the growth on LinkedIn is phenomenal, particularly in the context of being a financial advisor, right? To your point, if you're a LinkedIn influencer, like it's an easier path, but what you're, that's a much tougher audience to grow is what you're doing. And, and, you know, going from essentially zero to 23,000 followers in a couple of years, like that's, that's pretty amazing. In particular, I've, I've noticed you've won some recent awards at Mass Mutual, and I think you're ranked number one within that business in terms of new business generation. Talk a little bit yeah. about those results. Yeah. So, like within Mass Mutual, one of the things that I've really been able to put myself on the radar for is, is bringing in clients because our main business model is a financial planning fee for service model. And you know, when you work, when you run your practice at a big company like this, they track all these things because they want to incentivize your advisors to grow their businesses, of course. And last year I had the most clients as someone under five years of tenure in my agency. And when it came to financial planning and then overall in the agency of over 200 advisors, I was actually the number three advisor overall. So a lot of success growing the practice. And, and, you know, that goes back to, Last year, 34 households strictly from LinkedIn. That's not even counting anything that came off of LinkedIn or, or from referrals and other things like that. But LinkedIn has no doubt been the the hub of my business growth. You know, speaking of Mass Mutual, I think something a lot of advisors will will wonder about <clears throat> is, and particularly with video, is compliance and how you've managed to work with compliance and how you feel about working with compliance because you put out a lot of content. So talk to me about that journey in a way that doesn't get you in trouble with your home office, but you, you seem to have figured out how to work with them. And, and again, you put out an awful lot of content. So it's, it's getting out the other side. So talk to me about that. I have to give the credit to our compliance at Mass Mutual Greater Philadelphia, but home office Mass Mutual as well. They have been nothing but supportive for me. So specifically, starting with our marketing director, Cynthia, I mean, me and Cynthia talk every day. She is so helpful to me and getting things submitted to our our reviewer in compliance. And then our localized compliance is very helpful with helping me stay within the lines and keeping that, that chain of communication with the localized compliance to the home office compliance. And sometimes I got to spend time and get on a call with them and, and talk about things. But I really respect them a lot because... I know that I'm only making their job very hard. I, I put content out every single day and I have a lot of volume when it comes to social media. That makes their job harder than it would be. And I get that. But all of these people that I'm mentioning, Cynthia, Tom, Greg, Bob, just some of the names that, you know, if, if they are listening to this, they'll know who they are. They have been nothing but supportive to me and, and even the managing partner of our organization, Anthony, Anthony Spaticchia, he has been in my corner all the time and been like, look, man, what you've built is awesome. We recognize this is helping you grow your business and we want to support you with this. We just need this to be a two-way street and we need you to, to give and take with us sometimes, but we're going to be in your corner and we're going to support you. So it, it's been really it's been successful because of open communication. And I think if you're an advisor that compliance is holding you back, have communication, you know, tell them, Hey, this is what I'm trying to do. Like I'm trying to put myself out there and build a social media brand. How can I do this? How can we make this work? What do I need to know? And, and those are the questions I've asked. Those are the things that I've gone about and I'm not perfect. There's been times where I've, I've had to fix things, but 
it's never like them talking down to me. They're there to help me. Well, I think that's a really important perspective to have, you know, especially when it's true, right? Not, I don't think every compliance department is as open as it sounds like yours is. And, and that's important for advisors to consider, right? If, if you are doing what Mondo's doing and you're trying to have dialogue and getting shut down, well, that might be time to find your Cynthia and a real partner in compliance because at the end of the day, compliance doesn't need to be about control. It can be about enabling you. It, but you got to find the right team that, that's doing that and, and well, be willing and, and, to participate in the process. And, and I got to say that, like, so Cynthia is our marketing director. She's been amazing because she's sort of like this intermediary between me and compliance to where she can help me and, and support me from the marketing perspective on how I'm doing it. And then sort of be that person that that is in between me and compliance and portray the things from them in the right way that I need to understand it. And it, it's a very good process that we've ironed out. Now, it's taken really two years to get to this point where we have a very good way to go about things. But I mean, I'm never going to talk bad about an organization, but if your compliance is not letting you do anything whatsoever, like... Maybe it's time you find a new organization. That's all I'm saying. I think that's a pretty reasonable point of view. Yeah, because they're limit they're limiting you. Exactly. And that that really isn't the job of compliance. Compliance doesn't need to do that. And you know, there are plenty of good compliance groups out there, good compliance departments and really great compliance people that are trying yep. to enable the business, right? And exactly. it isn't about eliminating all risk. It is about managing risk and making sure that folks are able to do their their job. And some of their job is going to be about communicating with the world. So I want to pivot and get one last topic in before we, we head for home here, which is about conversion, right? We've talked a little bit about this and talked about newsletter conversions and appointment conversions. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about what conversion is about on LinkedIn and what are the important components? And I'll kind of kick it off in, in that conversions kind of start with your profile. And so if you could talk a little bit about how that works and how you've worked to optimize conversions and sort of how you think about it. And, you know, we talked about some of the results, but we'll, we'll loop back in there, but talk about conversion on LinkedIn and how you think about it. It's going to come when you invoke emotion in the people that are reading what what you have. So my headline, wealth is more than money, I will show you how. Financial planning for SaaS professionals. For those who don't know, SaaS is software as a service, also known as tech sometimes. That That's really the niche market that I, I play in with clients. Right. And so, what we're so reading that, here for the audio folks is we're reading... Mondo's headline, right? So this isn't the profile thing. This is the the little bit of text that shows up basically everywhere you go on LinkedIn. So that's that's the first thing people are going to see about me. But if you scroll down here, John, to my about section, the content is going to sell, of course. But my about section is what I want someone to really go read. And this is what I think will will make the conversions on who's going to book a meeting after viewing my profile. And and you could you could look at the about section. It's the same as a post really. Yeah, right. Just I was just going to say that. Emotion, emotion, laying out the the, the context and and showing the understanding and then giving the solution and pivoting to the call to action which is booking the meeting. Right. And and of course, so you've got a pretty optimized headline for yourself. You got an optimized about section. You're your your profile image is is strong and you've got a, a really nice banner up top that says enhancing your lifestyle, which kind of works in a way that's complementary with your your headline, you know, wealth is more than money. And then talk about the actual mechanism. So, you know, you've got a featured section, which is a lot of what you drive people to, and your two offers, and sort of talk about how you think about those offers and driving people there and where, you know, how else you do it. 
newsletter is the main one because I just want to grow that and get more people in email. That's a more intimate setting where I can go even longer form than LinkedIn. They'll spend more time with me. Also, I found people will reply and you can get more in like intimate conversations naturally through email. But the second one is to book an actual meeting. I realize most people are not going to trust me enough to just go right to book a meeting, but they might enough to like go on my email list. So that's why I have it in the order I do. Yeah. And I always keep that book a meeting there because, hey, you want to book a call, take 30 minutes and I could learn about you. You could learn about me. I'll do that with not just not anybody, but just about anybody for lack of a better way to put it. And if it if it's not worth continuing the discussion after 20, 30 minutes, usually for someone that it's not worth continuing the discussion, I'll know after 10 or 15. But if it's not after 30, well, then we won't have the second call where we really go in depth and talk about process. So that's why I just leave that there. If we get to a point where we're not taking clients anymore because capacity is, is too strained, I'll probably take that out and just leave the newsletter. But right now, where the business is at and in growth mode, we keep that in. Right. And something that was implied in what we just talked about that I think is worth discussing more completely, which is this idea of your ICP, your ideal client profile. And in your case, it's, it's clearly high earning software as a service professionals. And how did you get there? And how do you think about niching down to, to sort of profit? What if I told you I don't think about it at all? <laughs> and I'm dead serious when I say that. I started focusing on software as a service professionals because one day I looked up and I had a bunch of them as clients. It was just a recurring theme of people in this industry aligned with who I was, aligned with my process, aligned with the value of it. And I'm like, geez, I got a lot of people in this space. Yeah. Maybe I should just double down on that. So I think a lot of times advisors will be like, I'm going to help pharmacists because pharmacists make decent money and that's a good place to build out a niche or I'm going to sure. help doctors. And you just use an example. I wouldn't get so obsessed with that. I think your niche should naturally come to you. And if you're a more seasoned advisor, maybe you haven't niched down yet. Look at your book of business. Who's a group of people that seems to repeatedly be duplicating themselves or, or being duplicated in your book of business Look at that. And I think that's where you niche down. I think the best niches come naturally. Yeah. Because mine, mine did. I'll tell you that much. And, and John, I tried multiple. I tried, you know, small business owners under $2 million. I tried doctors because my father's a family doctor and my aunt is a family doctor. So I'm like, oh, that's an idea. Didn't work out, even though I had reasons to go that route. This one has been very fruitful, but also because of the things I mentioned. I align with them and it naturally came to me. I think it's a really interesting point of view because a lot of people will talk about, you know, niches are where the riches are, right? You hear Alex or Rosie talk about this and you you hear many people, what Michael Kitsis is another one who will talk about, you know, niche and and how to how to make that work. You very rarely talk about when in the life cycle of your business you ought to ought to be in a niche. And I think it's really interesting to think about it empirically, basically to let the niche emerge from those who resonate with you, who show up and, and choose to work with you. And there may be a niche or a commonality. It could be profession. It could be psychographic. It could be geographic. It could be a bunch of different things, but all based on sort of what worked as opposed to committing to something and then, you know, Oh, it looks like you don't know how to talk to doctors or you, you know what you have to say doesn't resonate with them for some reason that's hard to see in advance. So I think that's a really really interesting approach and smart and it clearly works for you. So so I think that that is fantastic and and now that you've done that now all of your content can be informed by that niche. But I also noticed that outside of your your headline in your regular content, that's actually quite subtle. You're allowing for lots of other people to sh still show up. Yeah, I think 
something that advisors who niche down and, and preach about it sometimes go crazy with is like, I can only work with SaaS professionals. Well, guess what, John? If I have a business owner who's making $10 million a year and wants to talk to my team, this is part of like the power in teaming. I have partners who who specialize in different niches, if you will. And not for nothing, money's money at the end of the day. Sure, I prefer to work with people in SaaS and that's really my bread and butter, but there's going to be clientele that don't necessarily fit that ideal client profile that I'll have a 30 minute conversation. And if I think I could help, we could work together if that's what sure. you want to do. So it, it's it's been funny how the problems and the emotion in general that that comes through in the content and through LinkedIn will bring people in who aren't necessarily my niche. And they'll say to me, they're like, look, I'm not in SaaS, but I, I like what you say. I think I might need what you do. Can we talk? I'll get that multiple times. And I tell them exactly what I t- just told you. Well, I think the other thing you got to recognize is a niche isn't forever. And new niches will emerge if you allow them to, right? Niche is kind of a convenience for your team to be kind of focused on a certain type of professional with a certain set of problems, but it you can you can do two or three as you grow, right? So so I think it you got to let it evolve, right? It you you got to it organically, you may expand from it organically, and that's smart. Now it doesn't mean that you're going to take wildly different clients that have totally different needs. They're probably somewhat related if you're going to be successful with them with, with your team. Yeah. But, but it, it clearly isn't something you've got to be religious about. And, you know, we talked about newsletter conversions, which, you know, you clearly, clearly you're knocking out of the park. What are you seeing in terms of actual appointment, you know, appointment setting stuff coming out of this, per week, per month? So with newsletter, it's it's tough to say because I really only have four newsletters that I've sent out so far. It's a new thing. My list is only about 650 people right now. Comparatively speaking, I have 23,000 almost on LinkedIn. So we're right. you know, a fraction of that right now. Yeah, so it's new. But, but you know, four, four newsletters, I've had three appointments set. So I'm happy that I have had any so far. because So that's newsletter just out of the it, newsletter. Oh yeah, just out of the newsletter, there's been three out of four so far, and I think two of those will become clients just based on the flow that's been going. So, I was t- personally when I started on LinkedIn, I was like, I'm going to do this a year, and if I get zero business after a year, then then it's probably time to stop. But newsletter, I was like, even though I've already gotten business on LinkedIn, I was approaching the newsletter the same way. I was like, I'm going to do this 52 weeks every Wednesday, 52 weeks. If I get zero business. Then we'll talk about if this is worth not pursuing anymore. Yeah. I knew I knew that I wouldn't get zero business, quite frankly. Like I'm not gonna be I guess sit up here and say that I thought that. But I've been pleasantly surprised that that's happened so far. And I, I, I've been getting good feedback from the people who are reading it. My open rates are over 50%. That's great. So I'm ve- I'm very happy about that. I think I'm building the foundation with it. I think it's like LinkedIn where you sort of have to get in the cadence that the people on your list will be seasoned. And and even if there's some cross-pollination there, they'll end up booking or be going to that next le- level down the road. And overall, across you know all of your efforts, LinkedIn, et cetera, you know, what, what kind of appointment flow are you seeing off of sort of the overall LinkedIn effort? So I could tell you back to January of 2023, I started tracking this. I wasn't tracking. I wish I was tracking it in 2022, but I wasn't. But 20, last year, I started tracking it. I've had 180 leads come in in 15 months wow. from social media. So you do the math. It's about 12 a month is yeah. the average. And, and when I say lead, that's like they booked a meeting on my calendar and we had the meeting. That, yeah, yeah. Like there's, been, there's been probably... 40 or 50 more that just inquired and then didn't book or show up. But 180 of like people have come on and about a third have done business with us. 
I think most advisors would sever their right arm to get that kind of lead flow. <laughs> so, so I, I think that is absolutely phenomenal. And before I let you go, and you've been super generous with your time, my friend, I'm curious if there's anything right now that you've been listening to or reading or doing that's been sort of inspiring you in terms of how you think about, look at your content and, and your journey here as a creator. This book I have behind me, uh, $100 million leads by Alex Hormozzi and, and his content in general, man. I Amazing. think the way, the way that Alex thinks about business growth and how you attract people to your business to do business with you, it's totally changed my mindset from the day that I, I started listening to him on YouTube and reading his books as they've come out, hundred million dollar offers had me totally change the model of my business and, and how we operate with what we're bringing to people. So I, I would say as a blanket answer, Alex Hormozzi stuff, and I can't recommend anybody listening. If you live under a rock and never heard of Alex Hormozzi, you should. So check his stuff out. And even if you have, and he rubs some people the wrong way, I will he say does. that I've gotten that feedback from, from people, but that's a good lesson. I think you, you're going to rub yes. some people the wrong way, but man, his stuff has been, it, it's as good free content out there as there is. It really is. No question. I'm a huge fan and yeah, his person, his persona personality, you know, is, it's really quirky. You, you've got this jacked guy with a big beard who's running around wearing a nose strip all the time and <laughs> to look at see this is don't judge a book by its cover to look at him you'd go what what can this guy teach me do not make that mistake y'all <laughs> this guy knows his stuff cold and yeah i I've, I've completely changed my way of thinking about a number of things thanks to his point of view i think it's I mean, it's really, really crystal clear. And so I think it's a great recommendation. We've come to the end of our time on The Augmented Advisor. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time and all of your learnings on LinkedIn. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you having me. All right. Appreciate you. 